All right, you guys, I'm sorry. Good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, Yafa, that was excellent. Philippe and I were planning the rest of your career while you were talking, so we'll tell you about it a little bit later on. I'm glad to see everybody here uh, this evening. We're really excited to be with you. Uh, today, I think I shared, at least on social media, that this was not an original stop. I've been in Southern California for the last few days in San Diego. I have a, another engagement in LA on Saturday, but my good friend Philippe called and said, could you stop by? And just because it was him, he told him, yeah, plus he owed me 10 bucks. And I wanted to get so I had to come get my money. Um, so, we want to have a dialogue. Again, um, I, I'm also, this is actually my first time meeting my good friends, Yafa and Philippe, face to face. Many of you are now in the world of social media, and you have friends literally all over the world that you consider good friends, but you've never met before. So for all the negative stuff that social media gets, one of the wonderful things is that we're connected, and we're able to have dialogue. Sometimes the dialogue's not pretty, but at least it's dialogue. The good thing is when we're talking. So um, you had here, Hillel students, uh, BDS vote, was that a week ago or was it two weeks? Time is going by so quick. Two weeks ago. Um, I, along with a lot of other people, watched it online. Not all 12 hours of it, however long it was. We watched some. We were pulling for you. We were glad that it uh, did not pass. Uh, but that's just the beginning. So I am, I'm from the of Washington. I'm the director of the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. I'm a pastor from Northern California. Not a politician, not a, not a lawyer, and all those types of things that I might have been for. Just an activist. Um, and this is something for me, uh, Israel advocacy, that is kind of over a long journey. And if we get into that part, we can discuss it. It just kind of wound, up, wound me up here. So I'm honored to be here with you. Hello students, I also want to say to you, thank you so much for kind of holding the fort. Um, we know uh, some of what the campuses are like uh, right around this time. As a matter of fact, when I first met Yafa, one of my first interviews with her, we talked about her experiences at Concordia University in Canada, how she was an unofficial spokesperson for Israel and the state and the case for Israel, um, and how she would do that type of advocacy there. Um, she was the first Ethiopian Jew that they had ever met. Um, so it was difficult them hearing all of this Zionist language coming from a black person. And it's not really all that strange when it comes to the United States of America, it's just been kind of covered for a little while, and that's part of what I want to talk to you about. So three little sections here. I always start, usually I should say we start um, in this type of introduction with Dr. King's pro Israel legacy, which we'll talk about in a second. So now again, uh, technology, it was working a second ago, it's working right now. It doesn't work any more than someone can help me actually press the button. Um, and I'll try to kind of go back and forth and not block your view, because there's some text that we're going to read. And one of the reasons why this is our starting point, is, doesn't have to be, but one of the reasons why we choose this one is because in the fight of the political and all the other applications that, would, that pertain to the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Dr. King's legacy, his words, his pictures, if you will, his words are oftentimes used in a very, very um, uh, open way. And I mean by that, his words about justice, about right, uh, they are applied in lots of different ways, lots of different areas, and rightly so, because those, those principles apply in lots of different areas. But he was also very specific. He was a pro-Israel uh, advocate, if you will. He, he advocated for the state of Israel, but it was in context. He wasn't just a blind supporter of the Jewish people. He was also a supporter of what he called, and you're going to see the quotes here in a moment, the Arab people. You'll see the term Arab come several times because the term Palestinian was not used in this context in 1968, which is where I'm going to take you. Okay? Some of his most pro-Israel words, some of his most staunch support for the nation of Israel came literally 10 days before he was assassinated on March 26, 1968. March 26, 1968, Dr. King was the special guest at the 68th Annual Convention of the Rabbinical Assembly. In a moment, you'll see some words that may have been familiar to you, particularly in this conflict. But what we find is that, like in anything else, words are powerful. The context is even more powerful. What I said is one thing. The context in which I said it 
really, really gives you its meaning. Otherwise, you don't really know the meaning. So, in this meeting with these rabbis, again, and I say 10 days because he was assassinated on April the 4th, 1968. So he had a, a sense of his impending demise. He even spoke of it. He wasn't suicidal. It's just that he had a, a sense that it was going to happen. And it's just interesting that one of the last things that he does, he sits down with rabbis, and they talk about a lot of different things, not just Israel. We're just dealing with the Israel part today because we don't have hours. There's a long transcript, and it's online. It's in different websites. We have it on our site, mc-now.org. You can type in rabbinical assembly. Dr. King will pull up the entire transcript. They talk about foreign policy, domestic policy, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, the upcoming election, you name it. They talk about a lot of different things. These rabbis take the opportunity to just kind of pick his brain. It's Dr. King talked to us. So when it came to this part, the question of Israel was couched not just in terms of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but in the context of race. And you'll see some of the language that I'm going to show you that was 40, 50 years ago, but it could be 2014 because it's the same issues that are being brought out right now. So Rabbi Gindler asked him the question. It wasn't his question, but he's reading prepared questions. And he says it here, Dr. King, what would you say if you were talking to a Negro intellectual, an editor of a national magazine, and we're told, as I have been, that he supported the Arabs against Israel because color is all important in this world. Remember, Arabs except to Palestinian because they didn't use that term at this time in 1968. In the editor's opinion, the Arabs are colored Asians and the Israelis are white Europeans. Would you point out that more than half of the Israelis are Asian Jews with the same pigmentation as Arabs? Or would you suggest that an American Negro should not form judgments on the basis of color? What seems to you an appropriate or effective response? Again, the term Negro is what they called African Americans in the 60s, leading up until around the mid 70s, and turned to African, it turned to black later on, became African American. Those are all political terms. I want you to know why he's using the term Negro. And a la Richard Silverstein, this is an offensive term if you've been born any time in this 20, 20th or 21st century. In other words, this is an antiquated term. Is it the same thing as calling an Ethiopian Jew Kushin? Not the exact same, but it is offensive. You don't use that term if you understand who you're speaking to. Makes sense. This is Dr. King's response. He responds in three ways because, as adept as he is, he's asked three different questions race, Israelis, Arabs. So he responds to them in order. Now, the only thing I've added is the length of it, but this is the order in which he said it. He says, on the Middle East crisis, we have had various responses. The response of some of the so-called young militants does not represent the position of the vast majority of Negroes. There are some who are color consumed, and they see a kind of mis- and anything non-colored is condemned. We do not follow that course in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and certainly most of the organizations in the Civil Rights Movement do not follow that course. He made a comment earlier because they asked him specifically about the militant movement of the black civil rights movement, and they asked him how indicative was it of the entire whole. His response at this time was, he said it's small, it may grow, but right now it's small, and that's reflective in this response as well. He dealt with the race. He didn't deal with the multi-ethnic identity of Israel, he just dealt with this question in terms of blacks or whites standing on the side of one or the other based on color. So basically, and if you remember some of his speech from 1964, the March on Washington, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character, his words are echoed the same way. He says, we don't judge the Israeli-Palestinian conflict based on color, we look at the merits of what's going on. And then he moves to the Israelis. And this is probably the most repeated quote of his since he's been assassinated. I think it is necessary to what it is necessary to say that what is basic and what is needed in the Middle East is peace. Peace for Israel is one thing. Peace for, that Arab, for the Arab side of that world is another thing. What you'll see here as he's making this comment, Dr. King models for us in a quintessential way, quintessential way that you do not have to be anti-Palestinian to be pro-Israel. And so he goes on to say, peace for Israel means security. And we must stand with all of our might to protect its right to exist, its territorial integrity. I see Israel, and never mind saying it, as one of the great outposts of democracy in the world, and a marvelous example of what can be done, how desert land almost can be transformed into an oasis of brotherhood and democracy. Peace for Israel means security, and that security must be a reality." End quote. He then immediately pivots to the Palestinian people. On the other hand, we must see that peace for the Arabs, see what peace for the Arabs means, 
in a real sense of security on another level. Peace for the Arabs means the kind of economic security that they so desperately need. These nations, as you know, are part of that third world of hunger, of disease, of illiteracy. I think that as long as these conditions exist, there will be tensions. There will be the endless quest to find scapegoats. There is a need for a Marshall Plan for the Middle East, where we lift those who are at the bottom of the economic ladder and bring them into the mainstream of economic security. You notice that paragraph right there is the stuff of a semester's work, of work and research because he's addressing multiple things while he's talking about the state of the Arab people at this time. I'll just pull out two for time's sake. The first one would be rather politically incorrect to say nowadays, and that would be scapegoat. Dr. King tells this gathering of rabbis that if Israel continues to build as a nation at this point now, about 20 years old, 1968, and the Arab plight does not change in the Arab and Palestinian territories, there will be an endless quest to blame someone for the plight. His words, not mine. He says, if there is a disparity that continues, there will be an endless quest to blame somebody for that disparity. One other thing that you need to notice before I keep going on to this next part, Marshall Plan, those of you who are in the Middle East history, March 26, 1968, you'll notice that it's almost a full year after the Six-Day War. One of the main distortions about his legacy is that he made these quotes somehow before the 1967 war that saw Israel gain the West Bank and Gaza, Golan Heights. It's not true. Was he weighing in on what territorial disputes and how should they should be settled? No, he never addresses that directly. But he speaks of Israel's territorial integrity while it is still in possession of land that it's even no longer in possession of anymore. Point? We have to be factual about what was actually said. Do we know what he would say right now? No, he's not here and he's been gone for almost 50 years. But we do know exactly what he said at this time. And to say that he said it before 1967 is completely incorrect. Marshall Plan. What's interesting about that, because there are a lot of different aspects about Dr. King's life and legacy that was very prophetic. In the Christian realm or the church world, we would call him a prophet. Not dubbing him as an official Jeremiah or Obadiah, but in a Christian sense, someone who God speaks to and he sees things afar off. You know, 10 days after this, or about nine days after this, his last speech, at the end of the speech he said, I may not get there with you, but I want you to know that we as a people will get to the promised land. I've been to the mountaintop, and I've seen the promised land. He was encouraging them because he knew he was about to die. The same way here, it's interesting he uses the term Marshall Plan. Marshall Plan, those of you who know already in terms of uh, world history, it was the, the plan that was developed by the United States and other powers to rebuild Europe after the Second World War. What's interesting to note is that to date, for the last 19 years, the PLO, and later on the Palestinian Authority, has received the equivalent of 25 Marshall Plans, tens of billions of dollars going to do exactly what Dr. King said to do. Yet poverty persists. Remember that term, scapegoat. Mahmoud Abbas, according to Arabic sources, makes a million dollars a month. Arabic sources, not Israeli sources. Mahmoud Abbas is worth $100 million. Arabic sources, not Israeli sources. Yasser Arafat died with billions of dollars in his coffers. They are still finding the money now. It's interesting that Dr. King said Marshall Plan, though he's not here, I don't think that's what he meant. One of the things that we applaud and we admire people like Dr. King for is their ability to speak truth to power. What would he say about the conflict right now? Who knows? He might say something about 25 Marshall Plans and there's still poverty. He might even connect it to scapegoats because he was a rather brave man. So the last part of this section here is that we see that when his legacy is distorted by those who would distort it, it's usually done in one of two ways. One, revise history by applying, misapplying his words using his words about justice, 
using his words about right and using them against Israel. And number two, by amending his views by saying that, yeah, but if he were here today, he'd be anti-Israel. I'll address that some more in a moment. We have to keep his words in context. An extended part of his legacy, if you will, was what happened after he was gone. The picture that you see before you here is obviously to the right here, Ralph Abernathy, some of Dr. King's most trusted advisors, Dr. King himself, Coretta Scott King, Representative John Lewis, who's still serving in Congress today. On the far right, the gentleman that are circled, A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin. In 1975, these men, along with other African-American leaders in the community, whether it was entertainment, whether it was uh, in the clergy, in politics, they formed an organization called BASIC, Black Americans to Support Israel Committee. And it wasn't just on a whim. There was always support within the African-American civil rights movement. But what happened here in 1975, there was a resolution moving through the UN. And that resolution was being drafted by the Arab states and the former Soviet Union together. They formed an unstoppable voting bloc to vote Zionism as racism, these African Americans formed this organization to decry that lie and also to continue to uphold the African American tradition of standing with Israel. I'll show you exactly the history of that. I don't know if we have audio, I forgot to ask that. Yeah, yeah. Cool. So I'll try to. No, that's okay, no, no problem. You might have to listen to it really closely. No matter how you feel about the United Nations, it's one place on the planet where nations get together and attempt to speak with one voice. That's why their resolutions can make a big difference. So when people all around the world see that approximately 40% of the UN Human Rights Council resolutions were against just one country, most of us would assume that country won. And then make that same comparison with other countries, it paints a surprising picture of the possible global standard. What could explain the enormous There is righteous indignation within the African-American civil rights community. Not just on behalf of standing with Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East, but for the pilfering of language. Barrett Rustin, A. Philip Randolph, and a host of other African-Americans basically said, how dare you? How dare you use that term? How dare you use our struggle to describe a democracy? An imperfect democracy? No problem but a democracy. How dare you conjure up Jim Crow when we were hung and burned? How dare you conjure up the transatlantic slavery? How dare you? If you need to fight about it, discuss it, discuss it. But don't kill for our legacy. How dare you? So they formed the organization. And they had, the, unfortunately, obviously, history, you know, November the 10th, the resolution was passed, 1975. The next day, they had a rally, basically along with a large part of the African American community and the Jewish community, they had a rally in downtown Manhattan. And they protested this, even after it was passed. 
There's a write-up done about it in the New York Times, November 23rd, 1975. There's an ad that's taken out, and they basically explain what their what their uh, uh, goals were, what their uh, uh, protests were, and in that ad, this is a little clip of it. Bear Russell said, Zionism is not racism, but the legitimate expression of the Jewish people's self-determination. From our 400-year experience with slavery, segregation, and discrimination, we know that Zionism is not racism. There are 300 names that appeared on the ad. Obviously, we don't have time to look at all of them. I just did a little grab and put some of them on there. And you can, depending on your generation, I'm older than most of you here, you recognize some of them. Mr. Hank Aaron, only a couple of them are still alive today, Mr. Hank Aaron, Reverend Ralph Abernathy, Mr. Louis Armstrong, and on. Again, from the entertainment world, the sports world, the political world, they all signed this petition, basically saying, we are highly offended. We don't appreciate it. Get your own story. Not out of a lack of concern of what was going on, but for the pilfering of language. How dare you? How dare you call a movement for a homeland racism when you have Arabs and Jews, and much later on as people are coming from different parts of the world, Jews and non-Jews living. As a matter of fact, Matt Rustin was a writer in some of the articles in some of the papers throughout the, throughout the country. And most of these he wrote during 1975, I'll read you a few quotes. This action, this article, I can't remember the paper right now, I see it at the bottom. The title of this article was The PLO, Terrorists of Freedom Fighters. These guys didn't pull punches. He says, one of the most distressing reflections of the unhappy state of the world politics is the ease with which words can be perverted, stripped of significance, and made to mean their opposite. <clears throat> Acts of murder and terrorism are transformed into gestures of liberation. Hijacking and slaughter of innocent children are carried in the name of peace. The word racism, once so meaningful to the oppressed of the world, has lost all objective value as it is often applied to democratic interracial societies as to those which practice the most extreme forms of apartheid. You notice that the whole apartheid uh, analogy didn't really take off in the United States, uh, or I should say on the world stage too much later on, but Byron Rustin knew where it was going. He knew if you're going to use racism, you'll probably use apartheid. Applying this measurement is apparent that some of the most blatant racist regimes are in the Arab lands. In Arab, Jews were hanged in a public square, while today napalm has employed uh, the dissident Kurdish minority. Syria rivals Nazi Germany in its brutal treatment of the Jewish citizens, who are confined to a cramped corner of Damascus, prevented from immigrating, and from time to time murdered with official sanction. And in the Sudan, it was, it was non-Muslim blacks who were the target of a genocidal war in which 500,000 were killed and many thousands more forced to flee their homes. This is before Darfur became a household word. In her brief history, Israel has forged an enviable record of social achievement. At a time when so many appear willing to accept lies as the truth, to reach dishonest conciliation with terrorists, to barter away the most basic ideals of justice and compassion, Israel more than ever deserves the support of people of goodwill and decency and common decency you see the date of that is January the 18th, 1975. Very politically incorrect language, but very, very clear. Another person's name, and this is that's often used to attack Israel. What was Benandela's stance? This is one of his last comments that he made about it when he was on a town hall meeting with Ted Koppel. I'll read our support for Yasser Arafat, he says, does not mean that the ANC has ever doubted the right of Israel to exist as a state legally. We have stood firmly for the right of Israel to exist within secure borders. Very similar to what Dr. King said about Israel's territorial integrity. So that was 2014, 24 years ago. Is that right? Yeah. About now. <clears throat> One of Dr. King's other trusted advisors who is still alive, Dr. Clarence Jones, about two weeks ago or so, and he still advocates for Israel today. Not just Israel, he does other political work as well. He's 82, not moving quite as fast as he did before, but he's hearing some of the chatter that's going on in the college campuses and in the world news. And he says, I am always a little taken aback, he says. I am seeing people quoting Dr. King frequently out of context to develop a thesis and argument that he would not be in support of the state of Israel, this is absolutely insane. No African-American leader of national stature was more passionate, 
privately and publicly than Dr. Martin Luther King in fostering a 24-7 working coalition with the Jewish community and his support for the state of Israel. From the standpoint of someone who has represented the great legacy of this extraordinary man, Martin Luther King, I say to my African-American brothers and sisters, speaking of the standpoint of the derivative relationship I had with Martin Luther King Jr., the time is now for every African-American person, every person of stature in the African-American community to come forward and stand with Israel in the alpine chill of winter, quote from Dr. King, to show that we are wintertime soldiers. Legacy. So what do we do then? Because clearly there's issues that have to be spoken to. And in the long tradition of African American civil rights, how do we address it? Again, is there a perfect? No. Perfect society? No. But in the conversation of human rights, social justice, this is what's happening right now to the Palestinian people in Gaza and the West Bank. Speaking truth to power might cause someone to say something about this as well. Honor killings, 100% uh, just over the last year. Young people in suicide bomber camps. I wrote an article, it's just not bad, a blog the other day posted in the Times of Israel. And in it, just on my heart, just to do, wrote it, put it out there, for what it's worth, discussed seven different reasons why the Palestinian struggle and the African American struggle are nothing alike. One of those reasons, violent uprising. Were there some? Absolutely. Black Panthers, they got their guns, they did their thing as much as they possibly could. But that was at the end of like a 400 year saga Nonviolent protests. And I said in the article, even if the African American community could have risen up and fought with guns and weapons and bombs, it would have never entered into our minds to strap them to our children. That's not about freedom, that's something else. The pilfering of language, the robbing of legacy. This is what Dr. King and later on his cohorts addressed. I didn't put the article on there, but when this was addressed and the UN told Hamas and Gaza they were trying to address the curriculum that the young people were using, Hamas basically said, we don't want a watered down, it's not teaching our children Islamic culture. And I'm not coming against Islam, I'm saying what, Islam, what Hamas said. It's not about a Muslim bastion. I'm talking about reality, what's going on on the ground. Hamas said, we don't want additions to our curriculum, we want our children to fight. It's against Islamic culture for us to teach them things like peace which was the nonviolent protest. Former extremist Dr. Taufik Hamid, I have no doubt the Palestinians are suffering, but what is the cause? Is it Israel? No, he said it's Hamas. If Hamas tomorrow said we accept the existence of the state of Israel, we will not launch terrorist attacks against them. And we accept our previous agreements and co commitments. The suffering of the Palestinian people will stop. So to our final section. You remember the question that we read that started the whole discussion with Dr. King? The rabbi asked him, Dr. King, again, what would you say to all this that's going on in the country here? I'm talking to he said, I talked to an African-American publisher of an article, of, of a magazine, an editor, and he says that we stand with the Palestinians because color is all important in this world. In the editor's opinion, the Arabs are colored Asians, and the Israelis are white Europeans. Would you point out that more than half of the Israelis are Asian Jews with the same pigmentation of Arabs? 
Or would you suggest that an American Negro should not form opinions on the basis of color? What seems to you an appropriate and effective response? Where are my Hillel students? Let's talk shop here for a quick second. Ipsy, along with other organizations, have been pushing the reality of Israel's multi-ethnic democracy, its multi-ethnic society. And one of the reasons is actually the question that was asked in 1968. Because you may not realize this being from your generation. One of the reasons why BDS was connected to South Africa apartheid was because of the prevailing understanding or belief that Jews were white Europeans. I'm going to go further. This comes out of black liberation, not black liberation theology, but a lot of militant thinking. Further, that the European Jews who actually made Aliyah weren't Jews at all. They were Kazakhs, fake, imposters. And so because that's the case, following the logic, they are colonizers. They've gone and invaded yet another land and stole it from the people of color. Regardless of the fact that even at the time of Israel's rebirth, there's a slightly more majority of Mizrahi Jews, Jews from the Middle East. But the iconic figure was a European Jew. So that's why Dr. King was asked the question. So what we've been doing in terms of pushing back, describing the reality of Israel's society, is reminding that Israel is a diverse society. And we use the term diverse by choice because it came from actually an Israeli uh, Jewish uh, of mine who was actually of both Nigerian and Italian descent. It was actually a phrase that he had coined. And one of the reasons why we see it's working is because the detractors are mocking it. And I learned this from my good friend Philippe. Never repeat the, the other side's words. Never repeat what they say. He would tell me all the time, do me sunny. Don't say that. I would post it. Do me sunny. Don't do it like this. I'm like, man, I don't man, my backup, man. God, <laughs> and as we're talking about it, the most effective ways to communicate the truth, not spread propaganda, communicate the truth. So this is from the other side, one of their uh, publications. And what you'll see here is it says on the top, I'll show you, meet Avi, the gay Yemeni Jew, paratrooper who works side by side with Yael. A recent immigrant from Ethiopia, and it's a cartoon of them holding a gun at a, presumably a, pair, a, a Palestinian woman in a wheelchair. When I first saw it, I was like, going, my first 30 seconds, like, oh man, you know, they're trying to mess up. And next picture was Zipora, a bisexual Russian beauty who also was a swimsuit model for the might that we might add, and Anat Asabra a served together in Hebron, and they're doing a selfie while they're apparently torturing somebody. And, you know, it's crazy. and then Gadi, who immigrated from Argentina, serves with the Israeli Navy alongside of Jews from northern Israel. And they're shooting some guy in a boat. So my blood is boiling. I'm going, no, no, no. And then the last picture here is really funny. Does this look like apartheid to you? Invite this group of vibrant young members of the Israeli diversity, force, Israeli diversity forces to your college campuses today. They're making fun of IDF Diversity Week. And then it hit me, Max. I went, they're saying Israel's diverse by choice as well. So what I did, I didn't publicize it. I did the next thing, I went, ah, thank you guys. That's a pretty cute picture. I like that. Because <laughs> what they forgot is that most people aren't going to keep reading. They're going to look at a picture. And you just show them a bunch of Israelis from different lands and different colors. Thank you, Israel's diverse by choice. When the opposition begins to report your taglines, that means they're working. What's the point, Dumisan? I'm glad you asked that question. Because the way that Israel was being bludgeoned, that's a white European colonizing power. And the opposition is now having to concede, a la Yafa, that Israel is not a white European colonizing power. Perfect place? Absolutely not. But Jews of the diaspora, and they have one thing in common, persecution. 
the Holocaust in, in Europe, as Yaakov said. What happened to Beta Israel in Ethiopia? What happened to uh, uh, B'nai Manasha in Syria, in, 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 I mean, in, in India and Burma? Over and over again, one of my good friends, uh, Rachel Waba, whose mom was an, uh, Egypt, was an Iraqi Jew, whose dad was an Egyptian Jew, and she told me her story, very similar to what Yaakov was saying, and I hear these stories over and over and over again, and the problem is that nothing's wrong with telling the Holocaust story, but when that's the only story, it actually feeds into the narrative of the other side, that they're European invaders. What connects it? Persecution of the same people. Different colors, different ethnicities, <laughs> all Jews. So, you say things like this. When Intifada against Israel starts, it's not against just white people. It's against Jews of all colors. Israelis, Jews and non-Jews. Friend of ours, a mutual friend of mine, the Philippe, Daniel Parman sent me this picture, a friend of his had taken. We do this as a meme sometimes. These are Ethiopian Jews in a bomb shelter in southern Israel, 2012, because rockets are being fired. Why are these black Jews in a bomb shelter? Because it was a lie, because bombs are indiscriminate. They don't care what color you are. They don't care if you're Jew or non-Jew. If you're anywhere in the vicinity, guess what? Gone. Why would you show these types of pictures in particular to the African-American community? to dispel the lie. This was not about white Jews or white imposters. This is about not allowing the people to have a state. Almost done. So BDS is racism. It's Jew hatred. Number one, not fixing anything where the Palestinian people are concerned. And number two, in terms of the return, we'll do that part a little bit later on. BDS, language that was taken from the apartheid South Africa era, means boycott, divestment, and sanction. If you're enrolled in Tel Aviv University, getting your graduate and postgraduate degree, that's not boycott, divestment, or sanction, because somebody's paying your tuition of the university in Israel. You don't get the concept. I had to tell some young people the other day, those who were for boycott, divestment, you're being played. When he finishes his degrees in the wind, what is he going to do after that? I don't know. But he's not boycott, divesting, or divesting from or sanctioning, because he's going to Tel Aviv University. And who does it hurt? The people. Yeah, this great aunt is in this video. <laughs> we got this picture sitting in. Who is this? this she's my great aunt. <laughs> Yafa's great aunt. She's my great aunt's sister in law. Some of Yafa's family in the picture. This is the Sikh celebration. Is this the Sikh? I believe this is the Sikh celebration. That actually said it in September. Sikh. Sikh. Which one? We'll talk about that later on because I have a question. That's far. The definition of elitism. One of them is marshalling your troops to fight a war that you're not getting ready to. President of Oxfam, you remember the Solar Stream hands, you know, the Solar Stream brouhaha, Scarlett Johansson, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oxfam and all other people, we demand that the Solar Stream close their plant in the disputed territories, apartheid, so they kind of on the show. And they let uh, Mr. Ben Phillips and the head of Soda Stream, can't remember his name right now, it's the last picture. They kind of had a debate about it. Because in that plant, some 12, 1,300 people are employed. Over 500 of them are Palestinian. So the simple question was asked, what should happen with those people? We want the plant closed. <laughs> so then the moderator, who's supposedly neutral, said, well, what about people? We want the plant closed, it's part time. So they asked the guy with Soda Street, what do you think? He said, well, you know what? We're not trying to settle land this because it's not a political thing for us. He said, the plant has been here for the last 12, 14 years or so, been there for a while. And he said, the people, they work together. It's, a, it's actually an example of Israeli and Palestinian cooperation. But Ben Phillips says he wants it closed. Why? Because it's not his job. What difference does it make to him? Close the plant, 500 Palestinians, unemployment line. And I'm going to get in my car and go home. Speaking truth to power, find another way to protest. If 
Find another way to get, don't get somebody else fired. It's like I told some of the college students, it's like me telling them to rise up against their professor and don't turn in the next assignment. What do I care? It's not my grade. I graduated from college already. What do we do next to me? So I, I don't know. Just, you know, rise up. Attica, attica, whatever. See, it's easy to use the words and not be attached to. Hence the whole, how dare you? How dare you use a legacy of blood, sweat, and tears of 400 centuries and not actually try to solve the problem? In a second here, we're going to converse. If you guys ask questions, make comments, anything, Philippe or someone's going to actually do the, the moderating and everything. And I'll say this last part that I said, the last thing, too, with the other conclusion that we made both in the blog and in our presentations. Again, this does not discount the suffering that's happening in the Palestinian territories. Nor does it say that Israel is a perfect place. But it is about having a real dialogue. If we're going to really, really, really discuss what's happening, how I'll give you a quick example of what I mean. <laughs> so, I told this story. Pastors tell stories and tell one more. Not from the Bible, don't get nervous. <laughs> I had the opportunity in Northern California to attend a lecture from a gentleman from Israel, and the discussion was Israel's war on Africa the Eritrean and Sudanese refugee and asylum seeker crisis. Some of you have heard about that. We've been following it closely, talking to members of the Knesset about it, following very closely, very, very, very bad situation. Being cleared up, but very, very difficult situation on all sides, been very critical on both sides. And so the lecturer gave a very one-sided view, spoke for an hour and a half, then began to take questions. This is a young man in the back, raised his hand, and asked one of the most obvious questions. I didn't ask the question, just listen. One of the main reasons I didn't ask the question, there's too many holes in the presentation, and I don't want to help him show them up. Wasn't going to help him do his job. So the young man raises his hand, paraphrasing, Mr. Lecturer, very good job. Man, I'm fired up, ready to go. What should we do? Logical question. You told us that Israel is waging a war on Africans hate people of color. They're doing all these horrible, terrible things. What should we do? Logical question. You know what the lecturer said? And I'm not kidding you, I quote, I don't know. Translation, I could give a damn. I didn't come here to advocate for the Eritreans and the Sudanese. I came here to dump on Israel. Not a 1-800 number, text this, hashtag, save the people, none of that. He wasn't even prepared for the question. Why? Because he could care less about what was going on. And that's what this fight is about. Talking and dialoguing means I'm invested in the lives of people, hurling verbal grenades and dismissing and delegitimizing. Apartheid state is a delegitimization. Why? On what basis does an apartheid state exist? Who's going to defend it? Israel's a Nazi state. That's just a blanket statement. You're not helping anything. Israel commits genocide. Really? It's doing a terrible job. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. <laughs> Pastor, you're being so facetious. I'm passing like a preaching death. I'm, I'm not talking to uh, making people's lives nothing. I'm saying words mean something. Bayard Rustin said words mean something. Because genocide is actually happening in other parts of the world. Infanticide is happening in other parts of the world. There are still apartheid regimes, like Gaza. And if you just use those words, the danger is that not only are you demonizing a place that it doesn't apply, you're making it dangerous for those. Remember that graphic I showed you? Over 40% of the UN resolutions against one state. Syria has been in the civil war for almost two years, almost 200,000 people. How many condemnations? That's the tragedy. And that's why what's going on in the colleges is so important because we have to have these dialogues. Last thing, I'm going to pass it pass them down. You as college students, I know you hear this, I believe the children are confused. I know it's corny, but it's true. <laughs> Meaning, not just your intellect, not just your ability, not just your energy and your life force, your natural willingness to want to change the world. You're supposed to want to change the world. That's why you started arguing with your parents as you got a little bit older, because you knew just enough to mouth off, but not enough to actually be on your own yet. 
Blah, 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 mom and dad, all right? Well, get out. Well, hold on, man. You take it a little bit further. I was just trying to say that um, I protest this right here. You're supposed to want to. So when you are manipulated to hear one side of a story, and it takes that natural ability of yours to want to change the world, you are being robbed. You are being deceived. And it's part of what we do when we do. Say, yeah, tragedies are happening. Let's take a look, let's discuss, and let's see how we can actually fix it without hurling stuff like segregation and Jim Crow. Let's actually look at what's happening and discuss it together. So, Philippe, let's discuss.